They have to fight. There is clearly uh, a lot of protection provided by that skin. It means it's difficult for whoever the attacker is to get at the vital, at the trachea, or at the veins and arteries, the carotid. Well, Deborah, that's possible. You say perhaps they had a kill and maybe the dog stole it. Yes, it's certainly possible. In Kanyeni was seen yesterday, though, and not on a kill. Um, well, it's not to say she didn't kill during the night, but that's certainly possible, Deborah. It just would be quite a coincidence for him to have had blood in that vulnerable neck region, straight, you know, with the presence of the dogs there. Oh, he's so tired. He's had a horrible morning. The worst kind of morning. And he'd do well to just hang with Mum for the next little while. Because she, of course, will probably remain slightly more alert than he will. He'll be exhausted. He'll be absolutely shattered. The adrenaline that was pounding through his body as he shot up that tree and then waited to defend himself if he had fallen out, nervous that he was going to fall out, that adrenaline now will be ebbing from his uh, endocrine system. And it, I don't know if any of you, you know, if you get a big shock, if you get very um, frightened by something, you, the immediate aftermath is a crushing sense of fatigue. And so that is what he will be feeling right now. He will be feeling a crushing sense of fatigue but a leopard cannot ever relax completely. They must not. Now, Julia, you say that house cats have got a self-soothing mechanism and purring is one of those self-soothing mechanisms and you want to know if uh, leopards have the same. Um, no, I don't think they do. I think just simply closing their eyes and having a rest is the best soothing that they can have. There's certainly a certain amount of soothing that would have been given by his mother, but she, unfortunately, must just wait for the adrenaline to ebb away. She must wait for her heart rate to come back to normal, and she must find a place where she can have a proper sleep free of the harassment from those dogs. Can you see her there, Craig? She's just inside. I can see one or two spots every so often. Hmm. I was going to tell Aubrey that he might want to come around this side. And I think he's got a view of her. I don't know. I mean, it was just, when was the last time we saw him? I think it was during the TV shows that Jamie had him. He's looking towards his mum constantly. Hello, DJ Scotty. You are a new viewer, and it's wonderful to have you with us here, DJ Scotty. My name is James Hendry. It's good to meet you. And we're sitting here with these leopards, and you're wondering why the leopards are not sitting right here with me here in a manner that would be discomforting to myself. In other words, why are they not attacking us? Well, DJ Scotty, first of all, I mean, it's a difficult answer to give, and I'm not sure that anyone quite knows the answer. First of all, they are habituated to vehicles, so the short answer is that they have spent time with vehicles from their very earliest days, and they do not associate us with either food or danger. Now, as human beings, most animals don't associate us with food. It's certainly not out here in Africa. Most animals associate us with danger. They associate us as with a threat. And so what they do is that most aggressive responses that you receive from an animal is born of fear. Now, there's no such reaction from these cats because they are used to us. They know that the vehicles mean no harm, and they know that the... Well, I mean, their experience of us is one of relative sensitivity, so we've 
kind of were around, but we don't really affect their lives, certainly not to their knowledge anyway. So that's one reason. The other reason, of course, is that we are not standing upright. And some people will tell you that they don't recognize human beings on the back of these vehicles, that they only see a shape. And to some extent that might have some validity. But as a friend of mine once said, you know, a leopard can spot a monkey's ear sitting behind a tree. You can't tell me that they don't see us for what we are in the vehicle. So I think they can see what we are. I just don't think they associate us with the threat when we're sitting down. So on foot, DJ Scotty, if we were to come along here, these leopards would melt away into the grass. And if I got close enough, for example, you could easily corner a leopard in a bush like this. Uh, if we got close enough to corner a leopard here, then they would attack. Only as a last resort would a leopard choose to push home and attack. So that's the sort of long story for why we're able to sit no more than 30 feet from a young male leopard and he's just not vaguely interested in anything that we're doing or saying. It's a very privileged position we find ourselves in. It's, an, it's a position of, I feel, um, real honor that we're able to spend this kind of time with these cats while they just get on with their lives. It's not just the cats, it's the elephants and the buffalo and the wild dogs and the giraffe and all of these animals. Now Marge, um, this is the kind of worm can that you open at your peril. You say, who names these cats? And at what age do they get named? I'm being slightly facetious. I'll give you the short answer to it. Basically, they are named by the guide and tracker who find them first. And it used to be at about a year old. So the first people, for example, to find Hosanna and Shongile, which are the two cubs that we've spent so much time with over the last year, was Brent. Brent was the first one to find them. He handed the honor of naming them over to Aubrey and Taxon, who are the senior rangers of Juma, where we spend most of our time. And they then chose the names. And the reason they weren't chosen, they were chosen when they were only about three months old. And the reason we didn't choose them when they were, or would wait until they were a year old, was because they are characters for Safari Live. And the sooner we named them, the, more, the sooner we were able to characterize them. The reason that they normally wait until a year old is because that's the kind of the first real big milestone that's on the way to independence. Often leopards won't survive to their first birthday. Mm. Lying down again. Well, Sierra, that's a good question. Where would a leopard keep a newborn from predators? Sierra, normally in a cave or in an, you know, under an overhang in a drainage line or in a riverbed, in a dry riverbed. Sometimes they'll take them into a termite mound. So like this termite mound here, it would have been opened up by an artfark at some stage. You know, artfark digging for termites and ants. And when that happened, then, you know, it opens up space. He's growling at his mum. And when that happens, that opens up space, and sometimes it's a good place for leopards to give birth. <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Scratching and sharpening his little claws. Nikki, you say, is Hosanna a bigger leopard because Karul is a better hunter? Uh, no. That would be to infer that Brent Leo Smith's mother is a better hunter than my mother. Um, 
No, I don't think so. I think it's entirely genetic. I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that Karula is a better hunter than Nkanyeni. Yes, of course, if animals do not uh, eat sufficiently, especially in the very early, early years or early months of their lives, they can be stunted for life. He's not stunted. I think that Hosanna is just particularly stocky. Um, I don't think he's shorter than Hosanna. I think he's the same height. I just don't think he's quite as stocky. And so I don't think it's got anything to do. I'm sure it's almost 99% genetics. I don't know who his father is. We think it's probably Shivambalana. Shivambalana is not the same size as Tingana. So his father is probably a little bit smaller than, than Hosanna's father. And who knows what genes she's carrying, big and small sizes. All right, well, there, there we have the two of them disappearing into the shade, so it's a good time to head across to the very tall, of course, Brent Leo Smith, from the short to the tall, and let's find out how his search for Tingana is going. Well, my search has been rather frustrating this morning. So, Tingana decided to vacate and go into Elephant Plain, and Allison was wondering about Tingana and Alison, it, Tingana is our dominant male leopard. Smith, I have Senzo on camera and sorry if you didn't figure that already and uh, I'm right on the southern boundary of Arethusa. I've checked the whole of Arethusa's boundary. I got very excited when I found those very fresh Tingana tracks and then he left. And then I got very excited when I found very fresh female tracks uh, I don't know who it is. It could be Shadow. It could be Ingrid's dam female, but she's been found now. Uh, but the tracks crossed straight across this southern boundary into Shirley's. So uh, it's just been one of those mornings. It has been absolutely beautiful out here, though. The light's been spectacular, and you, I know you guys have having been having the most amazing time with our secret agent man and wild dogs, leopards. I'm not going to lie. I'm more than a little bit jealous. And also, if you want to ask us any questions, you can do so by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And when you see me lean out of the car like this, it means I was checking that junction for any tracks. Now, since the leopards and lions have evaded me, and the wild dogs as well, I'm going to try and find one of my favorite little canids, and a canid is of course a member of the dog family, on the southern end of the Arethusa airstrip. So quite often there's a family of side-striped jackal that like to hang about in that area. So we're going to go see if we can find them. Oh my goodness! Hi, Gino. Gino is wondering what is the oldest leopard that I have seen. Uh, it'll probably be the three, four female to the south of us. And the last time I saw her, she was about 16. And I know she survived a bit longer than that. Now, isn't this a lark? Now, many of you who have been watching for quite some time will know when we come to the Arethusa airstrip, there used to be a very tall sort of treehouse structure next to Buff Pan and I thought I was going absolutely bonkers a second ago because it's gone they must have taken the treehouse down now uh, those of you who will remember that Scott Dyson had a tea party for Gracie in that treehouse now the treehouse has vanished well, of course it's not vanished, I'm sure um, there were some people who took it down, but it used to be right there. And it was very high as well. But, there we go, no more treehouse. It's gone. Wow. And the last time I was here, uh, in this particular spot, was with a male cheetah, and the treehouse was still here. That was a while ago, but... There was definitely a treehouse. When I, I, when I was driving down the boundary, I was looking ahead and I was going, am I in the right place? Something looks like it's missing. Okay, 
Now this is the spot where we might get lucky with those side striped jackal. Okay, well, fingers crossed that the family of side striped jackals are still around. I'm going to scour the southern end of the airstrip for them while we do that. Let's go see how Mr. Sorrell is doing on his bushwalk. Well, Brent, we um, are also in search of animals and we haven't found anything. For those of you who are just joining us, we are on a bushwalk at the moment. And um, we, we've had an interesting morning so far. We had some elephant earlier, which is really exciting. A lot of very interesting tracks. And for some reason, there seems to be a lot of snake tracks around at the moment. I'm not sure why, but there seemed to be a lot of snake activity last night. Um, we had giraffe tracks earlier, but unfortunately, no luck. So, um, so the giraffe were hiding from us. We didn't find any of them. I'm just finding biting flies at the moment. <laughs> that wasn't very nice. Um, no buffalo. So we were wondering if we'd find a, a buffalo too. We've just passed some little water holes, small little pans. Now those are ideal areas for animals like buffalo because they like to mud wallow quite a lot and they do enjoy those areas, especially now with it starting to get quite warm. But unfortunately, we didn't find anything. Um, but we're still going past some other water holes, so we will have a look. And hopefully we'll find some other animals, maybe some giraffe if they are around. It's um, still very thick. We're in this area where there's a, just come, come through a drainage line. There's a very prominent drainage line which runs through Juma. And those areas are ideal for, and usually they're ideal for finding animals like leopards that are fringe hunters. They enjoy thick areas, especially when it starts getting warmer. And... Um, Unfortunately, we haven't found any tracks yet. I know Brent was trying to look for Tingana. He didn't have any luck either, but that's the way it goes sometimes. James has had all the luck this morning in terms of predators. I mean, wild dog and leopard. That is really amazing sighting, and that doesn't happen very often. Um, yeah, sure, it is, it is quite warm. just want to double check. Whenever we come out to these drainage lines, just have a good scan around, because there are little water holes not far from here. It's always important to know the area very well. And just have a look at, uh, you know, where, where you know the water holes are, if there's possibly anything around. Just because you never know. And there could also be animals coming down to the water hole. Perhaps the elephant or the buffalo coming to drink. Or well, it doesn't necessarily have to be them. It could be a herd of impala. It could be, um, it could be oh, anything. Kudu, giraffe. So you want to try and find those animals and see them and not disturb them and try to view them on foot. But the animals are very, very alert when you are walking around. Oh, I think this looks like a really nice stick. I might just use this. I was looking for a walking stick. I might use this as my new walking stick. Look at that. Okay. Well, I'm going to continue my search with my new walking stick. Maybe it brings me luck. Let's head back to Brent, find out how his morning is going on. Well, alas, no side stripe jackals on the southern end of the Arethusa airstrip. I'm now on the eastern boundary of Arethusa, and I'm just hoping that shadow pops out somewhere here. but we have no tracks. Now we have literally covered 90% of Arethusa this morning uh, with no luck so what I'm going to do is I'm going to head back up towards Gauri Main and I'm going to head south from there and have a look if there's possibly any sign of Hosano or Shungile coming back into Juma. Now I haven't been to Arethusa in a while so it, it was it was a, a good a good check. Now I was really hoping that the Inkahumas might have come back uh, from the from the west, sort of headed southeast from uh, Sibambili back into to Arethusa, but alas, they are obviously still very much in uh, in Sibambili. And I know Shadow hasn't been seen in quite a few days. Um, I'm wondering whether those tracks I had on the southern end of Arethusa were shadows. 
but I mean we haven't even seen an elephant I think we've seen four impala one sternbok and a squirrel on Arethusa this morning but it goes like that every everywhere has its ebbs and flows I mean there were male leopard tracks on that left were female leopard tracks so they're around but they're just outside of my grasp at the moment because those male leopard tracks were smoking hot fresh they were really fresh I think I must have been maximum of sort of half an hour behind him but that is the way the cookie crumbles but as with everything, every leopard that leaves, there's got to be a leopard that comes into our traverse somewhere. And of course, we've already had Nganyeni and Vutomi. Now, I, I didn't hear, but I don't know if James uh, saw any suckle marks or, or, or signs of Nganyeni giving birth. I'm always very, very slow to, um, to, to jump onto those bandwagons. Uh, I generally would prefer to see it myself before I make any calls. That way, don't get into trouble. So it's not impossible that she, she's had birth or and has cubs. It's unlikely, especially with Vitomi being still under 18 months old. Um, I'd say it, it's very possible, but it's, it's just unlikely. And I know a lot of people think the reason we might not have seen Karula is uh, that she and she did mate with Singana and uh, she could have cubs at the moment. Now, I'm probably not going to be very popular for saying this, but uh, the last time I saw Karula, there was absolutely no sign of any pregnancy on her. And uh, that is a leopard we spent an incredible amount of time with and uh, view constantly. So. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable to say she definitely was not pregnant. So I don't think she is hiding cubs somewhere. The, the other thing is that uh, if she was, she's not going to go have, have cubs in outside of her core territory. And that means even if we hadn't seen her, we would have definitely seen tracks of her. Uh, all the guys to the south of us would have seen tracks of her. I'm still holding out hope, but uh, we've, got to, we've got to come to the realization that every day we don't see any sign of her now. Uh, the more and more chance uh, it is that we're probably not going to see her again. And as sad as it is, that is life. This, is, this isn't, this isn't um, Disney and animals die here and they, and, and they die quite frequently. I, uh, with leopards, I'm, I'm quite happy that often when a leopard dies, it just disappears and you, and, and you don't see any sign of it. So, but as I said, there's still hope and we're going to wait a little bit. I don't think we can be, we can be positive uh, until she hasn't been seen in six months, for example, but uh, every day that it goes longer and longer, uh, the, the chances of seeing her again decrease. Hi, Anisha. Anisha uh, is wondering that uh, when is it true when leopards first give birth, uh, often their first litter is stillborn? Uh, not to my knowledge, Anisha. Uh, that is absolutely true with hyenas, but uh, not with leopards to my knowledge. And uh, of course, hyenas have a very different and, and modified uh, modified uh, birth canal um, with their enlarged clitoris but with leopards I, I wouldn't say it's true so we're nearly back on the southern boundary of Juma I'm just trying to avoid these corrugations so most of the big main roads or access roads like this one that are used uh, develop some nasty corrugations uh, just because there's a lot of vehicle traffic on it Oh yeah, let's speed up a little bit, try to get over the corrugations. Bit of sand surfing. Okay. 
let's find Hassan or, or Shongile. Fingers crossed, we've got some fresh tracks, or even better, we've got them themselves coming back into Juma. Let's be happy! Now, I'm crossing back to Juma from Arethusa. Let's go to the man who hasn't left Juma all morning, Byron on Bushwalk. No, I have not not left Juma, Brent. Um, I think I, it'll be too far for me to walk. <laughs> Although we have covered quite a lot of distance this morning, but I we just found those giraffe. I'm going to see if we can see them. They did spot us and they moved away. Hang on. So as I said, checking these water holes is important. Um, now let me see if this giraffe is still around. I only saw one. Just the the head of one and then it moved off. Let's walk in here a little bit. Luckily I've got my big stick so I'm not too worried. <laughs> I just want to double check there is a um, there's a water hole ahead so I just want to make sure that there's no buffalo or anything around. Let's see if we can't find this giraffe. I wonder where it disappeared to. It's amazing how these tall animals can just disappear so quickly. I don't think it's very far. Oh, I can hear them moving. So I can't see them. You can see there's like a wall of green in front of us at the moment. It's very thick but I could hear them moving and I think they've heard us. So they're a little bit, a little bit nervous. Let's just have a look. So it's quite exciting and this is a lot of fun trying to get a view of animals on foot. I think they've moved off unfortunately. But you can see how thick it is. I mean it's easy for these big animals to disappear. Oh dear. So oh there the ox pickers just flying over us. Okay, I'm going to just check this area once more, see if I can find those giraffe. But let's head back to James, who still has those leopards. There we are, everybody. They have moved off now. And I think that they're going to go into the thick bush. I might go and climb a tree, might do a little bit of hunting. We're going to follow them for the next two or three minutes. But this bush, the grass is so long and the bush is so thick that I think it'll probably be more trouble than it's worth after we've had such a wonderful sighting of them. So let's just spend as long as we can with them and then we'll probably let them be. There they are. Not sure... You know, I don't know why they would have disappeared off that termite mound. It looked so comfortable. It looked like a good shady spot to be. Maybe there is a kill somewhere that she wants to go back to. It's possible. I'm going to go right this way now. I love it. And he's just growling at her all the time. He's desperate for affection. Oh, sorry, Craig, you can't even see. I can see beautifully over here. There you go. Well, Dingo, you say is there vocalization between mother and cub when they are... <laughs> when they're in danger? I don't think there's a huge amount, no. I think they tend to be very silent when they're in danger. They're going back towards that tree. He's... They're going straight back towards the Zephyrus bush. Dinga, they, they will just growl at whatever the threat is. I don't think that they will... They might... I mean, they, they did talk to each other a little bit from the top of the tree where they were, or the two trees that they found themselves in. They were doing a little bit of sort of contact calling, but it wasn't a huge amount. I think this is wonderful. They've gone back here now. 
Craig, tell me when you got a shot. Is that all right? Yeah, I'm not sure it's going to be better than that, I'm afraid. <laughs> See, she's looking at us now. She looks pretty relaxed, I must say. She was just giving us a little bit of a hairy eyeball there. Hmm. <laughs> she was... What a morning we've had. No, Kale Swift, you say, is this their normal territory or are they encroaching? Kale Swift, they're in completely the normal spot for her to be. This is her territory. She's in the middle of her territory. Her territory extends pretty much most of Cheetah Plains. Well, certainly most of the eastern portions of Cheetah Plains, the eastern three quarters of Cheetah Plains. Isn't that a wonderful shot there of how hidden she is? And so she is completely in her territory, yes. We are now in the middle of Cheetah Plains, pretty much. I don't know why they moved off. I'm not sure. The activity at the sighting is very much reduced. There's not a lot going on here. It's just us and Aubrey. She, you know, she's watching us. I'm just going to talk quite quietly and ask Craig to move very slowly if he does move. Not because I think there's any danger, but because I think she's obviously still feeling uneasy after what was a very trying morning for her and young Vudomi. Craig, are you being bitten by flies there? Ah, Craig had a spider running up his arm. It's starting to get quite hot now. I imagine the temperature's probably gone from about 75 degrees or so, and pushed to around 82. Apparently it's 25 and 77. Well, it might be in the final control. It doesn't feel like that here. Of course, we are sitting in the sun, as opposed to in the shade, so we're... In Kanyeni is sitting there, it's probably about 25 degrees or 74 Fahrenheit. Stealing's Wren Warbler in the background. And that expectation of the morning now completely dissipated into the peace of the mid-morning. There's so many wonderful times of day here, and there are markers, you know, there are different times when the, the different atmospheres sort of kick in. Obviously the dawn is the first one, and this for me is the second one. It's like the morning is not over, but the expectation of the morning is complete. And now we move into the peace of the midday. Right, everyone. I don't. I don't. I'm not going to move the car again to get a view of her. I think that she's had enough of being around us for the day, and so I think if we lose her again, we're going to move out of the sighting, have a quick look in the Cheetah Plains clearings, and just see if those wild dogs haven't come back, and then we'll head back towards Juma. Alrighty, well let's head across to Byron, who apparently has not managed to find himself his giraffe, but he has managed to find a plant known as Hypothelia dissoluta, I think.
Oh, James, hypothelia dissoluta, oh dear. Now, um, hypothelia dissoluta, is that signal grass? I can't remember. Oh. <laughs> and this is signal grass over here. And I think, you see what happens when you stop using the scientific names for a while? I've forgotten which one that is. And that's, uh, James will probably shout at me because we learnt it. Um, Often with him, we, we would learn the scientific names of grasses out there, and I've remembered most of them. Hypothelia desoluta. Oh dear, I'll have to double check that. James is going to be cross with me. It's getting very warm, but what I wanted to actually focus on was how the grass is starting to change already. And a lot of the grass is starting to turn this. is, um, brown, is uh, uh, turning this brown colour at the moment. Um, and James, the. That's right, the uh, Hypothelia desoluta is uh, thatching grass. I think it's common thatching grass. Now, um, this is not it. This is not it. This is signal grass over here. Um, over there, that's what that is. But, see if we can find some thatching grass. There's a lot of, lot of various grass species around here. Sure, it's getting very warm at the moment. The temperature definitely is increasing now as we get closer to nine o'clock it's amazing how uh, it is still very very warm I'm looking forward to winter but as I was saying and if we just look across here too how the the color of the bush is starting to change slightly since brown gr the grass is starting to turn that brownish coloration there's still a lot of green but I can definitely see the change starting to happen so that's great moving into winter and I'm looking forward to winter I do love winter in the bush the temperature is very nice um, not as many bugs for those of you who don't like bugs winter's great then because uh, you don't see as many bugs makes it a little bit more difficult on bushwalk because obviously we rely on the bugs now i'm just trying to listen out rick i'll get your question shortly just hear oxpeckers again ahead we've heard a lot of oxpeckers but to find these animals that they're sitting on is not always easy those giraffe ran from us unfortunately just double checking. Now Rick, um, no, we don't find different animals in summer and winter, or however we would have different bird species in summer. So the migratory species, the birds that fly down to South Africa or Southern Africa for the summer, we'll obviously see them in summer and winter they migrate again so we don't see them. That's about it. But in terms of the, the wildlife and the, the mammals and the reptiles, and the, they're always around. So um, we'll always see them, that doesn't change. Down here we don't have migrations. Uh, the animals, because the temperature in these most of these areas is pretty stable throughout the year and there is generally food and water around, there's no need for them to migrate. Um, the only thing is, I suppose, they, they may move into certain areas looking for food and water and obviously the, they, they'll have to feed on different vegetation, especially the herbivores, but they'll always be around, which is nice. So, so that doesn't change at all. And none of our animals hibernate, well, unless I suppose the snakes do, the reptiles do, um, but no, none of the, the mammals uh, will, uh, will hibernate. It doesn't get that cold yet, yeah? even though, like I said, the temperature does drop and the behavior of animals might change slightly. They might be more active, and I'm referring to, to a lot of the predators, they'll probably be more active and move around a lot more in the winter because the temperatures are cooler, which is really nice for them. But in the summer, they'll rest a lot more. Like now, I would say that lions, most of the leopards are probably starting to settle down for the day, find some shade and rest, because it is starting to warm up quite a bit. I know if I was a lion, that's exactly what I would do. And that's what those males were doing yesterday. It was very, very warm. They found a nice shady spot and they decided to go and rest. Now, I'm just really having a look. I mean, there are a lot of these old little mud wallows. And you can actually see one. Actually, just to ha have a look here quickly. Um, because I'm curious. I think this is completely dry at the moment. Let's see. Now, there are buffalo tracks that have come in. And this is completely dry now. This mud wallow, just a few months or a month ago, probably had water in it. Um, there was an after all that rain, so animals would have used this, but it's dried up completely. Interesting to see. I'm going to continue walking around, see what we can find. Brent was still looking for Hosanna and Shungile. I wonder how his search is going. Let's go have a look. Well, it seems to be going like a lot of my searches this morning, not very well. 
so I haven't seen any tracks of them coming back and uh, well this is sort of the hot zone for Shungila in particular between Baboon Pan and Twin Dams oh hello it is a spotted creature but not a leopard it is a spotted camel leopard and it was having a drink a young male giraffe there we go isn't that incredible how awkward it is for a giraffe to drink now oh, it's got to bend the knees and get their head all the way down like that now of course that poses a few problems is that just are we on full zoom sense I just want to, oh he's in a turn, I wanted to look at his bum, looks like he had a, a run in with a, uh, some lions at some point, but he, he escaped. Hi big guy. He's that long tongue licking his nose. <laughs> That's a new definition, um, well of picking your nose. Imagine if you could pick your nose with your tongue. Well, a giraffe can. <laughs> uh, he's probably just trying to get a water out that might have snuck into his nose. Oh, he's going to go down again, it looks like, for another drink. No. Oh, look at that. Very graceful animals. I uh, know quite a few of you were hoping to see a giraffe, and here we go. Oh, he's not going to hang around too long. He is south of our boundary, and oh no, he stopped for us. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's a kudu. Uh, so a kudu, a giraffe, probably no shungile. It looks like he's thinking about where to go and what to do next. Ah, and just bring up some cud while I decide. So, re-chew my food before I go looking for some fresh food. You can see the bolus in his mouth, in his cheek there. When he stopped chewing, he seems to be listening to me. There we go. Start chewing again. Yum, 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 yum. Now, of course, giraffes are one of the most silent creatures in the African bush. They don't make too much noise. The only time I've actually ever heard giraffes make noise is when they've had lions attached to them and during game capture. Now, catching giraffe is not an easy thing to do. And uh, what you do is you half sedate them so you don't give them a full dose from the dart gun because otherwise they could fall badly and hurt themselves. And then what you do next, it sounds quite crazy, is you actually trip it. But you try to trip a giraffe slowly. So you run with ropes around its legs and you try to bring it down very, very slowly. It, catching giraffe is very, very dangerous uh, for the humans and for the giraffe. So you always need a very experienced team of game capture experts when you want to move giraffe from one place to another. Oh, and it's got some ox peckers. Hello, Winter Prism. Winter Prism's wondering, do giraffes in the wild ever lie down? In a DD, they do. Um, of course, not on their side, but they'll tuck their legs in and they will lie down, but their head and neck will still stay up. And uh, to be as tall as they are, they've got many, many different, uh, very specialized genetic Oh, sorry, evolutionary adaptations. So the valve at the base of the skull that stops the he uh, the blood rushing to the head when they drink, the tight skin on their legs that stops the blood rushing to their feet all the time. So very, very specialized creature. Now, a lot of people always assume that a giraffe's long neck is an adaptation for feeding. Now that is just an added side benefit. The real reason for the giraffe's long leg is the ladies. So the longer your neck 
the harder you can swing and the harder you can bash your opponent. So it's a sexual adaptation, which is mo most uh, adaptations in all animals uh, ha have to do with either food or sex. Now there's a leopard track, and that looks like Hasana, but crossing into Little Gauri. Oh dear, he snuck in and he snuck out. Little devil. Okay, well, alas. Oh, let's actually let's go all the way down, check to Cheetah Cut and see if Shungila came back. But while we do that, and uh, hopefully one of our searches is going to come to fruition this morning, let's go see how James is doing deep inside Cheetah Plants. Well, we are probably going to leave Cheetah Plains fairly shortly. We've just done, the, we're doing the southern boundary, so that's Mala Mala off to the right hand, left hand side. And, well, there was nothing in the clearings except one lonely wildebeest lying in the shade. So we left him to his sort of morning constitutional. I think the dogs have carried on to the south. That said, the grass is so long there, they could have been lying three feet from where we were, and we would not have noticed. We left the two cheat, the two leopards, two cheetahs, the two leopards, exactly where they were when you last saw them. And maybe we'll go back there this afternoon. Well, I won't. I'll be on foot this afternoon. But somebody will probably come back this way and see if they can't find them. So what a wonderful return it has been for our trip to Cheetah Plains. The morning started off much more difficult than it than it has sort of transpired to be. We had no signal on Jigger. We were supposed to open the show and then we had black screens and I thought this car is definitely going to be a disaster today. But it's turned out just fine. Oh, there's a very gorgeous butterfly. I know how you love to film butterflies, Craig. But the gorgeous thing about it, there it is. See it there? Now I think that that is a male common diadem. I'm pretty sure that's what it is actually. Because I think that I saw a female as well. But I can't see her anymore. Isn't that gorgeous? On the plant that keeps on giving the Waltheria indica. It is a very, very great shot of the common diet. And then, Craig, just to the right-hand side there, there's another butterfly. It's brown with a sort of white triangular stripe on it. Can you see it there? Yeah. It's a moth, actually. Oh, did you, did you see it? I think it moved. There it is. No, it's not a moth, it's a butterfly. With its wings folded up at rest. But it's a fatty, it looks a little bit like a moth. It's a real fatty. It's been eating way too much Waltheria juice. I have no idea what that is. Anyone got any ideas? Hashtag Safari Life. Tell us what butterfly you think that was. Here it is. It's right here in front of us. Up, 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 up. There it was. It's right here now. Now it is there. There. You got it there. That's it. Oh, come on, butterfly. All right, we're going to call that the White Triangled Fatty. I think that's a good name. The White Triangled Fatty. Goodbye, Diadem and White Triangled Fatty. Of course, evidence that the sticks pride would be quite nice at this point. 
and find out where they are. I haven't seen them for quite some time. They were last seen by me on the airstrip at Arethusa, but that was some time ago. Is this a road? I think we'll take this road. The bush is so thick here and it really it becomes very difficult to spot anything. Oh, there's an elephant. Now Mead, this is a very good question for what we're just about to look at. You say, is there anything in the Kruger Park that I would change to benefit the animals? I probably would. Um, there we go. Young elephant bull. Mead, I would remove all water points that were not rivers and those rivers that have dried up as a result of human intervention for so because we've sucked them dry because of agriculture or residents I might then pump water in small pans along those rivers so I would not have any dams I would do away with all dams because they're not natural what that would do of course is result in a massive die-off of impala uh, quite possibly elephant and I just think that more balance although balance in nature is a ridiculous concept I'm not going to follow him, he's going through some thick stuff there um, I just think it would provide for a more diverse ecosystem with which is probably how it was before human intervention so in the you know in the early days of the Kruger we assumed that providing water for animals was a good thing uh, it certainly benefited some but it certainly uh, was disastrous for many others so I would take away artificial water I would try and make sure that I would probably increase the number of tourist roads tourism is extremely important to the Kruger Park I think that tourism is the only way that conservation will survive because well obviously it provides funding but it also the more accessible you make a place like this to people to tourists the more of course people will fall in love with the wilderness and be inspired to look after it so I would probably increase the number of tourist roads and things and just not to the impact or detriment of the animals but certainly there are vast swathes of the Kruger that are not uh, enjoyed by tourists and that's okay but I'm not sure that it's necessarily to the benefit of all conservation then I think that the size of the Kruger Park at about three and a half million hectares uh, if you combine it with the Zimbabwean portions and the Mozambican portions <coughs> It's probably almost large enough to leave as an open system. So I would try and take hands off completely. I would try and make sure that no more culling of hippos took place, that there was no culling of elephants and impala and buffalo, because those animals have increased as a result of the provision, I think, of artificial water. So I would very much try and take a hands off approach where we allowed nature to take its course. Now that what that would do of course unfortunately for some is that it would cause times in times of drought or in tough times there would be die off of animals and there would be areas that started to look like deserts but that's how it's always been and so we would just have to come to terms with that with that being the case. So those are the things I guess that I would do whether I would be correct in doing those things or not well that is another matter because everybody who owns a piece of land or has the ch oh goodness gracious me there seem to be a few animals in the way here this elephant is thinking to itself hmm I'm not sure why I'd like to live in an area without artificial water provision because I quite enjoy going to artificial pans to bathe in the mud and drink the fresh water she's just having a listen looking now to the left that entire little suite of behavior we watched was entirely for our benefit 
She wanted to know what we were up to, what we were doing, why we were here. And I think they are actually going towards one of those water points now. I think they're going towards the three in a row pan. We'll follow them for a little while because we ain't going to be able to get around them. Sorry, Donald, the communications are not great here. I got, how can elephants drink that? Ah, how can they drink dirty water and not get sick? Donald, um, the reason they're able to do drink dirty water and not get sick is the same reason that people in India, for example, can drink the Indian water, whereas people not from there cannot drink the Indian water without getting sick. I know this from first-hand experience. It's because they're used to it. They're used to the bacteria and that sort of thing that they find in the water, and so it doesn't affect their bellies like it would affect pe uh, people, certainly, and animals that weren't used to it. <clears throat> that said, elephants of all the animals out here will choose to drink clean water over muddy water every time. Look at this little thing coming here. Young bull just giving us a little bit of a rough time in the long grass. because he's managed to sort of get himself separated from the herd because he's too cool for school, so he doesn't want to be with the herd. Here's a young cow. It's quite interesting. Two teenagers on a date. That's interesting, you know. Do you see that the way her tusk is recurved like that? I wonder if this isn't the herd of Fang. There was reports of that herd being on Cheetah Plains yesterday. Maybe that's Fang's daughter with that squonk, um, squonk tusk Fang, for those of you who don't know, is a very large matriarch of one of the herds that comes in and out of this area, and she's got a recurved tusk that almost sort of touches her knee. You wonder how she walks without spiking herself a tiny little thing up ahead. Now this kind of movement of elephants definitely indicates a sort of beeline for either a feeding point or for water. And I suspect it's water. And the question is now of course were Fang to have a daughter, would her tusk be recurved because of some genetic defect? Yes, I think probably. I imagine it is a genetic thing, a little bit like buck teeth. And so it's not definite, I suppose, that Fang's daughter would have a recurved tusk, but it is possible. Apparently there's a spider about to bite me on the neck. Where is it? A spider or a tick? Or do you want to take it off, Craig? It's all very well pointing at it. Is it a spider or a tick? Oh, goodness gracious. Have you lost it? Oh, there it is. Oh, is it? No. I think it fell down. It's a tick. And so it will die. No, it won't. It's escaped into my bag. Oh, no. How oh, deeply distressing. It'll have to starve to death. Thank you, Rebecca. Nasty arachnid crawling along my... crawling along my shirt. So I would say, yes, that the genetic chances of Fang producing a uh, elephant with a squaff tusk are probably much higher than any other elephant would have. In the same way that if you have buck teeth, uh, you will probably birth a child with buck teeth. Or quite possibly. They're all settling to feed a little bit now, so maybe they've decided to come to a feeding ground. Maybe it's not necessarily water that they're going for.
very lazy walk along the road. Now, if Fang was here, she would probably be out front if they were going to water. And I think the junction is just up ahead where they'll probably turn north, so we might be able to get a view of her. Yes, they're having a nice feed now. Hello James, an interesting one about Asian elephants versus African ones and you say while we were there did we notice any obvious differences in their behavior compared with the African elephants. You know James we spent a day there uh, or a day with Asian elephants <clears throat> and um, during that day uh, you know we don't we didn't get to spend the same amount of time with them that we do with the African elephants. So I'm going to say no, I didn't notice anything vastly different. I, it felt so familiar, it felt ex very familiar to be around those elephants. They spoke in the same way to each other, they trumpeted at each other in the same way, they reacted to vehicles with much the same body language. So no, I mean there really wasn't much of a difference. I'm sure that if I was to spend more time with Asiatic elephants, um, I would notice much greater numbers of differences. But I didn't this time round. Let's carry on. Youngsters at the back now are trying to catch up. Alrighty, we're going to go towards three in a row pan. We'll see if the elephants make it there. While we do that, I believe Brent is also approaching some water. It's getting hot enough for a swim. <clears throat> it is nearly hot enough for a swim and we have arrived at the Buffles Hook waterhole and we have a single hippopotamus. There we go. Hello, Ippo. Oh, and Hippo is not the only one. We'll come back to the hippo. But there, in there, so where my finger is, Sands? Zoom in there. Zoom, 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 zoom. In the shadows is Africa's Black Death, as it's called by some. And it's a buffalo bull. Hello, buffalo. Now, as James said, it's getting hot enough for a swim. And that buffalo, I think, is indeed heading down to the water for a wallow and a drink. Now, it doesn't look like the most relaxed buffalo I've seen. You can see those head, head swings and the odd snort. And there's an oxpecker sitting on top of its horns. Hello, buffalo. And of course we have the hippo with us as well. So we'll wait to see if the buffalo comes out of the shadows. But we do have the hippopotamus right next to us. There he is. Now he enjoys the swim almost all the time. Except in the night times when he's out looking for food. When you find single hippos like this, it is a generally a young male that is trying to avoid all the big males. I love that sound when you hear the water of the hippo breathing. The vocalizations, all those harumphing, as I like to call them, mm, oh, 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 is generally done by when there are more hippos around. And it's very uncommon for a single hippo to harumph a lot by himself. And it is definitely getting a very warm now. I'd say the temperature's probably gone up three or four degrees in the last half an hour. 
and that's degrees Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Okay, well, other than that, not much else happening here. So that buffalo is still not looking very relaxed. So I'm sure he wants to get down to the water's edge and he doesn't want to do it while we're watching. So I'm gonna move on. Now, a lot of you, I, uh, ah, there's another buffalo, but also not looking very relaxed. So I, I'm gonna give them a chance to come down to the water hole and uh, so they can enjoy. And uh, we're gonna go across to Myron, who's got some tracks of a very interesting member of the Viviridae family. It is indeed of the Viviridae family, and this is a little civet track. Brent, so you're 100% right, and I can just see a beautiful look at this is the back pad over there, and the one, two, three, four toes. Beautiful round track, almost looks like a cat track, but it's not part of the cat family at all. And it's walked along here. Now this section of the track actually looks a little funny. But what's happened is a bird has stood on top of the track. These civets are nocturnal. So often a lot of you might ask, how do we gauge if the tracks are fresh? So these tracks were from last night because a little bird has stood on top of the track during the day. So that's why the track is not very clear over there. And the bird has walked through. I just want to see if I can't find another little clear civet track for you that's walked along the road during the course of the evening. Let's see. Quite a few tracks around here. Um, it's starting to get very, very hot now. We are starting to sweat. Um, looking forward to those bacon and eggs. <laughs> I know Tristan always teases me about the bacon and eggs. I wonder what is for breakfast this morning. Have a look. Where are those clear silver tracks? Here's some wildebeest tracks though. Just having a look here. These are wildebeest tracks heading up to the clearing and some heading back this way. Um, back down. So what would have probably happened is yesterday the wildebeest would have moved up to the clearing for the for the evening. And um, and we'll just see. Uh, uh, I mean, they would have seen uh, slept out on the open uh, on the clearings, and then moved out and gone and started feeding during the day, um, or just out into the bush and then back to the clearings for safety at night. Just to give you an idea of how big these tracks are, so this is quite a large track. I mean, look at the size. Sorry, look at the size of my hand compared to to that track. So, I mean, sorry, my shadow's in the way there, but. You can see just more than the length of my finger. So quite a large track for the wildebeest. That's a nice clear track. So as you know, we get these herds um, walking onto the clearings, a quarantine clearing outside of camp. A lot of tracks around there. I mean, a lot of wildebeest that come out into the evenings, um, go out into the clearings for the evening, and um, and spend the nights out there. The impala go out there. The zebra go out there. So you'll see a lot of tracks heading backwards and forwards to those clearings. And there's some hyena tracks again. We saw hyena tracks earlier. Um, so there's a lot of activity on the roads at the moment, which is great. And we spoke about the tracking. I love tracking. I love seeing little interesting tracks. We've seen some scrub hair. If I can find, oh, here we go. Here's a beautiful clear civet track. Have a look at that. That's lovely. Very, very clear round track of the civet. And that's a, you know, that's a really, really nice clear track. Now, we've just been focusing on the tracks for a while, but James has had a lot of luck with finding animals, and it sounds like he's got quite a lot of activity at one of the pans. Let's go see what he's found there. Here we have the same elephant herd. They've just come down to the water here to have a drink. It's marvellous stuff watching them like this. It really is very special. And the water is relatively clean because I think it's being pumped at the moment. And it's not Fang's herd. I thought it might be Fang's herd, but it isn't. She is certainly not around here. So I'm not sure exactly who the matriarch is. 
but there are no very old females in this herd. Most of them seem to be sort of in their... Well, there might be one female in her early 30s. That's the one just off to the right there, Craig. I think that's probably the matriarch. She was the one leading them towards the herd, towards the water. And here comes a fairly substantially built female. Hello, madam. If you could avoid coming too close to us, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Just going to drop my voice so that she doesn't become offended by my person. Oh, it's very special to be this close to an elephant cow. Of course, the temptation is such that you just want to reach out and touch one. Obviously, you don't do that because that would result in death. And no one wants that, Craig, do they? No. A very short drink, not a long drinking session, and I find that quite often. <laughs> Tiny little things. Hi, guys. A good day. <laughs> totally relaxed with us, as long as we don't make a noise. And these younger ones getting even closer than the bigger ones did. And Beth, this is a very common question that we get asked, and it's an interesting one. You say, do elephants ever have twins? Now, this female in front of us, the fangish one, is also missing the bottom third of her trunk. Now, this is a different cow from the one that we used to see all the time, that we call the half-trunk herd. And I don't know why she's missing it. I just want to let her move away. They're moving to the other water hole now. Beth, um... They do have twins from time to time. It's not common, but it does happen every so often. And I imagine very difficult. I mean, there's not a lot of space for two elephants inside of one elephant, I wouldn't have thought. And they'll probably move. There's a game path that moves along here, and they'll probably move along that and eventually into the bushes behind where they'll probably feed for a little while, there they go, they'll feed for a little while before settling in the shade for a good chew. And of course we know now that the latest research shows elephants sleep for only about two to four hours of the day, and that's normally the dead of the night. So there won't be a huge amount of time for them to snooze during the middle of the day, but I think the youngsters will probably be allowed to have a little bit of respite. Some of them will lie down, some of them will not. So I think we'll leave them disappearing off into the bush there. And I'll show you one more thing here at three in a row pans. There is a lilac breasted roller sitting out in the open. Can you see him there? Yes, that's him there. And I'll tell you that in India we saw something called, unsurprisingly, the Indian roller, which looks like a lilac-breasted roller that has just dived into the mud. All the colours just much darker. Yes, you see he agreed with me there. Did you see that, Craig? He said yes. Not quite as brilliant as our African version of the lilac-breasted roller. Marvellous. Good, on we go.
Okay, we're going to head on from here and out of Cheetah Plains back towards home for breakfast. While we do that, Brent Leo Smith, I don't know if he's managed to get into the water with that harumphing hippopotamus. I suspect probably not. No, no, I avoided going for a swim with the grumpy hippopotamus. And uh, I heard some monkeys alarm calling, so I came down here. And uh, they've disappeared now, but it, it's very interesting because normally in this area when the monkeys alarm call, it's at a leopard or a lion. And then I noticed none of them were sitting high in the tree. They were all sitting right in the thickest part of a Timbuti thicket. And I just saw a martial eagle flying over. So they were alarm calling at a martial eagle. Now, we've obviously wild dogs. Ah, still a long way away in the north. I think it's the same pack as yesterday. I'm not sure which pack it is. Now, as I was saying, we, we had a discussion about what's happened to Karula a little bit earlier. And quite a few of you are saying, but she's done this before. Uh, she disappeared in April 2015. Now, there's a the very big difference why she disappeared in April 2015 to now is that... Uh, Quarantine and Konuma were getting big and full of nonsense for her at that age. So they were stealing all her kills. So she was trying to avoid them. Uh, that was the reason she became quite scarce around here because those two young boys stayed around here for quite some time. Uh, the other big difference between then and now is that no one is seeing her. Before they were seeing her in Buffalsock, they were seeing her in Torchwood. And, uh, at, Rexon, Taxon, Aubrey have all checked Buffalzook and Torchwood very carefully now. Uh, so she's not being seen in the north, she's not being seen in the east, and she's not being seen in the south. That's why it's so 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 concerning at the moment. She also historically has never really le left cubs this young alone. She, she's always been such a good mother. Uh, and that's why I think we, we need to start sort of being a little bit pragmatic as I said I hope to eat humble pie I will happily eat humble pie I hope she just steps on the road in front of me but every day now it's it, that that chance is going to be less and less and less and it is very sad but she if she is gone she's left an unbelievable legacy uh, of, of leopards in this part of the world and uh, her legacy will be continued by Tandy Shadow Shongile and the males and quarantine, Konuma, Shivambalan, Shivinzi. Well, we don't know what happened, Shivinzi, but she's left probably one of the, the greatest leopard dynasties if she has gone. I'm not saying she has for sure yet, but she's left one of the greatest uh, dynasties of, of leopards uh, that I've ever heard of uh, in, in, in South Africa. And uh, I think we should always remember that and, and celebrate that fact as well. Now, what is at the waterhole, the second waterhole? Is there a grumpy hippo? There is not. There are some basking terrapins. And they are very lucky that little Shongile is not here because she would definitely be stalking them. So the basking terrapins sitting on the sandbank over there. There we go, enjoying the nice early morning light, or oh, well, not so early morning um, warmth at the moment, so it's, it's nice and warm now, so you know, helping regulate their body temperature by basking in the sun, and once it gets a little bit warmer, I'm sure they're going to go plop back into the water. Other than that, we can hear all the oxpeckers to the left of us, and Oh, there's a whole tree full of birds. Oh, well spotted. I didn't notice that. I got sidetracked by birds, so let's go back to the terrapins. Bye, well done, Eggsy. Uh, Zander spotted it, so go back to the terrapins and then slightly to the left of them. A little bit more left. A little bit more left. Left. There we go. Center frame. Not the terrapins, up a little bit. There we go. There's a water monitor. A big one. 
and that was what Shangile missed. She nearly caught that big, or one of the big monitor lizards uh, a few days ago, but she ended up catching a baby one. So there we go. And of course, it, there always seem to be a lot of more monitor lizards at this particular water hole than the others. And I wonder why. Now, the main reason probably at the moment is that there's a lot more sort of vegetation in the water here, so drowned grass. So you're going to have a lot more aquatic insects and frogs that the monitor lizard is going to love feasting upon. And I like everything out here, they get feasted upon as well. Now Kirk is wondering, uh, are we next to a natural water source? Uh, Kirk, this one is actually a man-made water source, so if we come out, you can have a look. Um, we're actually on the, the dam wall, so this is the Mwati River, and uh, there's a dam being put here many, many years ago, and what happens is that when it rains, the water flowing from upstream hits this big earthen wall, and stops and forms a, a deep water source to the to the side of us. Now, let me see, I was trying to see what birds were in the tree, but it looks like they're just doves. That's quite boring. Doves. Let's see if we can find something a bit more interesting than a dove. Oh, there's another. Look at that. Do you see him? Sense? Um, see it swimming. You got it. Look at that. There's another monitor lizard. And that one's swimming through the water. In that flooded grass I was talking about, so hunting for different aquatic creatures to snack on. You can see its tongue coming out, doing some testing, tasting. That's so cool. Now we have two species of monitor lizard here, the water monitor and the rock monitor. Uh, of course this, as you can see, is a water monitor. Now the water monitor is also uh, able, or the rock monitor, sorry, is also able to swim, but uh, would prefer not to. And there is another species of monitor lizard in Africa, which I've been lucky enough to see, and it's also very, very pretty. It's called the ornate monitor, and it is another type of water monitor. Well, let's let him slither off, or oh, oh, sorry, let's not slither. He's not slithering at the moment, he's swimming off. Uh, taking to James's idea, except uh, if I was going to go have a swim, we have a perfectly good swimming pool at Inger's. Okay, well, I was hoping for an interesting bird or two, but looks there not to be too many around here, just a massive amount of doves and uh, let's go across to Bushwalk who's got something who wants to say new. <laughs> we do indeed Brent and we saw their tracks earlier or we saw tracks of one wildebeest and I said they moved backwards and forward from the clearings and these ones seem to be lying out on the clearing at the moment and I think the reason is because it's so hot they're looking for a bit of shade. So nice to see the wildebeest, the herd of wildebeest. Just trying to scan. I was hoping to see some impala in that around here too. But for the moment, I just see the wildebeest. And I think, I think what's happened is the other animals like the impala have possibly moved off. And they're probably feeding through the, through the thickets at the moment, trying to stay in the shade. It is very hot, but there's a lot of grass still left on these clearings. So that's why these animals are happy to stay here. Nice to see a group of wildebeest. Let's walk a little bit and see how they react to us. We might get one or two snorts from them. And they do ha have that very entertaining alarm call. And that's basically how they get the name canoe. Is that I can't do it, but uh, it's a very strange sound. <laughs> Give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good, I think. Yeah, yeah not bad. There, yeah, we're getting some snorts now. Let's see. Ah, now they've stopped. See you know, the tails swishing, there are probably a lot of flies around them too. I mean, there have been flies all over us this morning. So, checking for ticks. No ticks. 
but um, but th those flies will be bothering those wildebeest too and that's why their tails constantly swishing around trying to keep the flies off of them just scanning to see if there's nothing else around at the moment but there isn't I think we'll be able to get a bit closer to these wildebeest they seem pretty relaxed they've seen us they know we're here um, and I think also the reason they're quite relaxed is because they see people walking up and down quite a lot so they sh hopefully won't move off too far but look at that perfect little shady spot that they found there um, oh dear, what, uh, Rebecca, who's the, the McCurdy Hurdy, what, was that zebra or ah, the zebra herd, sorry, I, for, I forgot about the McCurdy Hurdy <laughs> I'm guessing that was Taylor's name that she gave to them. Um, no, unfortunately not. No zebra around at the moment. Um, they've probably gone on holiday like Taylor has. Maybe that's what's happened. I don't know. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Oh uh, wait, Brent's got a beautiful bird he wants to show you quickly. Let's have a look. Well, you can see that incredible iridescence shining off a Birchall starling in uh, this late morning light. And he's foraging away in the grass, trying to catch himself some breakfast. And not too successfully so far. Oh, there we go. Senzo spotted another one. Oh, there we go. There's one sitting out in the open. And you can see the heat haze already uh, behind that starling. So it's getting hot very quickly this morning. Oh, look at that heat haze. Isn't that unbelievable? But we are coming towards the end of our sunrise safari. And we're going to keep moving up towards quarantine. And it has been, well, a very spectacular drive. I am absolutely, completely, and utterly riddled with jealousy this morning uh, for what you got to witness with James. And uh, oh, that must have been incredible. I can't wait to see the footage of those dogs jumping up trying to grab the leopards. Uh, very, very exciting. But on a positive note from our side, we had a very different drive to James. Uh, there were very few sightings, but uh, we did get a good chance to check the whole perimeter of Arethusa and Juma, and we can comfortably say that there is nothing here. They have all left us, but that means they could come back for the sunset safari, and I'm sure someone is going to be following up of, on Inkanyeni and Vutomi, and possibly even those wild dogs. So from Senzo, myself, and the whole Safari Live team, we will see you in a few short hours for the next adventure.